the P theorem and this is a, a really remarkable fact And in fact, this fact is completely fundamental in all of this. Is, at some level, this is where the structure is put on these functions. In, in any proof of these inverse theorems, we use the following fact again and again and again to go from something that's combinatorially structured, like has, satisfies some relation, as in this definition, to something that's actually got some algebraic structure, some bracket, such that. Well, again, this is a silly way of writing it, but the probability that phi of x equals psi of x, by which I just mean the proportion of points on which phi equals psi, um, is bounded below uh, by a function that depends only on delta. And here, k is, it also only depends on delta. So the statement of the theorem is that Approximate homomorphisms are bracket linear, at least on a, on a chunk. And as I say, this is somehow the point in the proof of all of these theorems where you're going from a combinatorial, a, quite a combinatorial notion to an algebraic notion. So I regard this as the heart of the proof. Um, right, so two things. First of all, how do we finish from here? Well, I shan't show you that, but... Um, Let's remember where we got to, if it's still somewhere. Hmm. Oh yes, maybe I raised it. So, that's unfortunate. Yeah, so I'm improving this U3 inverse theorem. I'd got to the point where I had these Fourier coefficients that varied in this approximate homomorphism way. And now I know they're bracket linear. Um, I get to make this R sub H here bracket linear. And it's not too difficult to go from that um, to making F itself a bracket quadratic. So if you've got a function whose derivatives are bracket linear, then the function is bracket quadratic. So there is an additional argument there. Uh, in fact, that's... Uh, the main new contribution by Terry and I over and above what Gowers did. Um, but I won't, I won't go into that. So with, as I say, with a bit of extra work, this statement, the structure of approximate homomorphisms, gives you the, U3 in, the inverse theorem for the U3 norm. So I'm going to show you the way that we know to prove this theorem, roughly. But I'd, I should say that this is a very mysterious result. The, well, the way of proving it, I don't regard as very natural, and it doesn't give very good dependencies. So, for example, we believe that this k should be just logarithmic in 1 over delta. That's a result called, that's a conjecture called the polynomial Freiman Ruge conjecture, which is very unsolved. And this here should just be polynomial in delta, this, this, um, this implicit constant here. So we don't know those bounds, and what I'm about to show you is surely the wrong proof. But it is the only proof that we have. So here's a sketch proof. Um, right, the first thing to do is to reinterpret what it means to be an approximate homomorphism. So we'll look at the graph of that approximate homomorphism, where graph means graph in the sense of freshman calculus. It's just the set of points, x, phi of x, um, where x ranges from 1 up to n. And it's a subset of z cross r mod z. 
So the condition that phi is an approximate homomorphism is telling you something about this graph. It's telling you that something called the additive energy of this graph is at least, is almost as big as it could possibly be. The additive energy, it's just right, the number of additive quadruples. E of gamma is the number of um, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma 4 with gamma 1 plus gamma 2 is gamma 3 plus gamma 4. If you just think about it for a moment, that is, it's the same as the definition that I gave you. Um, and now we bring out what one could call the, the machine of additive combinatorics. There's a sequence of results which have been applied in several different contexts, and we'll probably hear, um, I don't know if anyone's, I think someone's going to speak about expanders, expander graphs on, on Lie groups where you'll see these kind of results being brought out again. There's something called the balog semerady gowers theorem. An interesting example of a theorem where the authors are not named alphabetically. That's because Balog and Semerady proved the theorem, or they proved a weak, qualita qualitative, quantitatively weak variant of the theorem. Uh, some time ago, and then Gower's provided a new proof that gives much stronger information. Um, and the theorem states that if you have, in fact, in any group, not even necessarily abelian, if you have a set with large additive energy, then it must have a chunk which has small sum set. So there is gamma primed, contained in gamma, which is a large portion of gamma, such that uh, gamma primed plus gamma primed is bounded above by, uh, well, let's say, that's some constant k times gamma primed, where k is um, well, it's actually could be I think delta to the minus six or something like that would work. Um, so I should perhaps explain this. What kind of sets have large additive energy? Let me just think about subsets of Z. Here is an example of a set with large additive energy. I'll take A to be 1 up to N, union just some other points. Um, I don't know, 2 to the N, 2 to the N squared, 2 to the N cubed, etc. 2 to the N to the N. So that set has large additive energy because there are many solutions to x plus y equals z plus w inside here. There are none inside here at all, but it doesn't matter. There are plenty inside there. Um, what, so what this balog semerady gowers theorem is doing is it, it's extracting that uh, structured component here. Um, um, and it's, what's meant by structured is has small sum set. So let me define that here. Um, a plus A is defined to be the set of all pairs, A plus A primed, A and A primed lies in A. And this is what we call an approximate group. This is an approximate group. Um, a. Well, here, so, so here it's gamma that's the gamma prime is the approximate group. Is that the definition of approximate group? It's one possible definition that, that um, in the abelian case, that the, the doubling constant of a, the ratio of a plus a to a, is bounded by k. So this is a, I mean, a, a k approximate group. Um, it's scarcely surprising that the, the graph of an approximate homomorphism should be an approximate group somehow. But this is... That's, yeah. So this means 
that A plus A is bounded by K times the size of A. Um, so this reduces the study of approximate homomorphisms to the study of approximate groups. And in the five minutes that remain, I will give the very briefest overview of that subject. Um, first of all, I have to say how it relates to what I've been talking about. So the, there is a theorem of Freiman. And Ruzia, um, which states that in, in this abelian setting at least, these approximate groups are all of a particular type. So, uh, to, so that I'm not stating a result that's false, let me just state it for subsets of Z, although I need it for subsets of Z cross R mod Z. So suppose that A is contained in Z and has A plus A at most K times the size of A. I mean, if you want, I should just remark that, I mean, it's perhaps worth pausing to think, why, why is this a sensible notion of an approximate group? I think it's very natural. It just says that if it were actually a group, then it would be closed under addition. And I'm saying that it's not closed under addition, but it's not very unclosed under addition. If you add it to itself, it just expands a bit. Then A is contained in a grid uh, P. So P is of the form set of all X0 plus L1 X1 plus up to LD XD where the Li range over some lengths, ally, and everything is bounded in terms of k. So d depends only on k, and, um, and p is, the size of p is not too much bigger than the size of a. So this is often called Freiman's theorem or the freiman ruzsa theorem. An approximate subgroup of the integers z is basically one of these grids, or a subset of one of these grids, also known as multidimensional progressions. Um, so if you apply, you need to generalize that theorem to subsets of z cross r mod z, which is not that hard. Um, and then you need to apply this theorem here and show that if the graph is a grid, then it's actually the graph of a bracket quadratic, uh, sorry, of a bracket linear function. That's not obvious. That involves uh, a little bit of geometry of numbers, sort of Minkowski's theorems and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's all I'll say about the proof of this. I just want to, in the remaining two minutes, say that the definition of an approximate group makes perfect sense much more generally in, uh, in non-abelian contexts as well. So if A is now some potentially a set inside some group G, not necessarily abelian, then we say that it's, or we can say that it's a K-approximate group Well, why don't I tell you the actual definition rather than the lie? It's a slight variant of this. So first, A is symmetric. I, if A is in A, then A inverse is in A. And secondly, um, that A times A is covered by a few copies of A. both on the right and on the left. So x is some set, x less than or equal to k. 
So it's a little bit different. It's actually stronger. It, it, it certainly implies that A times A is bounded by K times the size of A, but it's a little bit stronger. And there's been a lot of work recently trying to find analogues of this freiman ruge theorem in this much more general setting. So the freiman ruge theorem was about approximate subgroups of Z. So we now have theorems um, about approximate groups in other settings, like inside matrix groups of fixed dimension and so on. Um, and I think uh, Jean Bourgain's talk will, will touch upon that a bit more later in the week, but I think it's lunchtime. I can take questions. Maybe, I mean, you said there had to be some staggered lunch, so people who don't want to ask questions should go and have lunch, and if they do, you can stay and ask questions or something.